Does that get us? Yeah. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get this uh, board meeting started of the Air Quality Management District on April 25th at 9.03 a.m. If the clerk could please call the roll. Carr. Here. Daniels. Frost. Gaylord. Here. Guetta. Here. Hansen. Here. Harris. Here. Kennedy. Lampson. Here. Lee. Here. Natoli. Here. Peters. Cerna. I'm going to have to leave at 20. Uh, Terry. Yes. To the Senate meeting. Thanks. We have a quorum. Thank you, Madam Clerk. If everyone could uh, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Salute the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, if the clerk could please read the uh, board clerk announcement for the televised audience. Sure. This meeting of the Sacramento Metropolitan Air Quality Management District is cablecast live without interruption on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on Comcast, Consolidated Communications, and AT&T U-verse cable system. This meeting is being closed captioned and will be webcast at www.sacmetrocable.tv. Today's meeting will be repeated on Saturday, April 27th, 2019 at 2 p.m. and Sunday, April 28th at 4 p.m. on Channel 14. Members of the audience wishing to address the board should fill out a speaker form located on the table at the back of the chambers and give it to the clerk. Please speak into the microphone when addressing the board and state your name for the record. Also, at this time, please silence your cell phones until the conclusion of today's meeting. Thank you uh, very much, Madam Clerk. Um, we do, do have uh, board members that may have to leave 20 before 10 and we may lose a quorum. Uh, we have a brief APCO report, the consent calendar, and then our um, fiscal budget to take action. So we're gonna be prudent with our time, but we're gonna go ahead and start with our APCO report. Thank you, uh, board, good morning. Uh, good to see you all. Um, we have a few items uh, that we'd like to, thank you. A few items that we'd like to discuss with you. We'll try to go through this quickly because we do need consent uh, uh, quorum for uh, a number of uh, items. Uh, we're gonna start off with a report back to the board on the uh, uh, trade mission uh, to China that, uh, that we participated in. Uh, Mr. Uh, Jaime Lemos is gonna give you a report. He's our acting director for our transportation group and he was uh, part of the uh, 25 strong delegation, I think, led by uh, Mayor, Mayor Steinberg that recently went to China. Good morning, Chair, members of the board. My name is Jaime Lemos. I'm the acting division manager for the Transportation and Climate Change Division. And uh, Director Patrick Kennedy and I had the opportunity to participate in this delegation to China um, that the Mayor, uh, Daryl Steinberg, had set up. And the focus of this uh, mission was uh, trade. Uh, trade in smart food, smart infrastructure, smart mobility, smart health, and smart power. In China, we visited three different cities, Beijing, Chongqing, and Shenzhen. As our director mentioned, there was 25 participants from the pi uh, public, private, and academic sectors. The sectors represented agriculture, data, education, public utility, transportation, and government. Our focus was the California Mobility Center, zero emission and autonomous vehicles, smart cities as it relates to transit-oriented developments like 65th and Aggie Square, and autonomous vehicles. On the top left, uh, this is in Beijing with the Beijing Municipal Transportation Commission Operations and Coordination Center. This is the DOT of Beijing, and Director Kennedy, SACRT uh, CEO Henry Lee, and the City of Sacramento, we got to meet um, with this, uh, uh, the TOCC here, and this was a representation of big data and how they collect data for congestion mitigation measures. Um, the far right, um, uh, graph of that picture represents all of their transportation, their light rail system, their subway station, their trains, 
and um, their, their public transit buses, and even their taxis. And in addition, 30,000 um, volunteers uh, light duty passenger vehicles. There's a number on, the, on that slide that says 5.2. I'm not sure if there's a pointer here. Well, there's a 5.2 up there, and that's their congestion number. So at that moment, um, in the city of Beijing, that was their congestion, 5.2 out of 10. So it was really uh, a really great collection system in which they, they monitored congestion. On the far right, top right, I'm sorry, is a Sacramento City Partnership signing ceremony with the mayor of Chongqing. And there we talked about trade. Um, they really wanted cherries, and they also wanted a direct flight from uh, Chongqing to, to Sacramento. So Sacramento County, I, I think that might be coming up your way. On the bottom left uh, is one of the smart city stores that we visited, Alibaba. There again is about um, big data. The collection of data as, as different people purchase uh, which makes the, the buying and the transportation of goods more effective and more efficient. That way there's no excess products. Uh, there was only one clerk in the entire store, and the store was probably the size of like Costco. Everything else was pre-order via app or through this uh, digital kiosk here. On the bottom right is our mayor talking about the opportunity of the smart investments in Sacramento. And this is at the Department of Foreign Affairs Office of Chongqing Municipal People's Government. We got to visit many different sectors, you know, as I mentioned, uh, agriculture, uh, industry, uh, big data. And um, of course, um, I was really excited that we got to visit Jing Kang New Energy Automobile Company in Chongqing. And they're in the process of developing EVs. Um, this is their, their new SF5. Um, still around 90 to 120 mile range, so they haven't broken through the 200 plus range. But as you can see, it is very cool looking and um, they're trying to make the vehicle affordable somewhere in the 35 to $45,000 range uh, equivalent here in the U.S. On the top right slide is the autonomous real rapid transit. This is still in their piloting phase, but this is something that we're considering for the streetcar project. Um, it's something that we've been looking at with uh, SACRT and the mayor's office, and so this is an idea. We did not get to see this in person since it was still in the, in the pilot phase. On the bottom left, we have the EV transit. Uh, this was very exciting, and of course, uh, Director um, Henry Lee was very excited to see this. In Beijing, there's over 10,000 EV buses and in Shenzhen, over 16,000 electric buses. So if Beijing and Shenzhen can do it, then Sacramento can also do this here. In Beijing, Chongqing, and Shenzhen, all of the taxis are electric. So this is a great idea as we start looking into Uber, Lyft, and all of any other ride-sharing trans uh, transportation modes. And finally, on the bottom right slide is, uh, we went to see a facility called BYD, which stands for Build Your Dreams. And this was in Shenzhen. And they have a massive portfolio of equipment, which includes cell phone batteries, power banks, electric light duty, heavy duty vehicles, such as cement mixers, refuse trucks, delivery vehicles, transit vehicles, and, and monorail trains. They also have a facility here in California, down in Lancaster. And so um, I think in the near future, we may be putting a, a visit together for that. Um, but that was our, our trip. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lemus. So autonomous trains and cherries, good trade partners. <laughs> Mr. Dr. Yala. And obviously, again, to emphasize, why, why do we care? Why do we get engaged? Transportation is the biggest source of um, air and climate pollution emissions. So we need to uh, educate ourselves and, and be current in terms of the future solutions. And obviously, China is the biggest auto market now. So as China goes in this sector, uh, that's where the world is going to go. Uh, moving on. Uh, just want to bring the uh, board up to speed on AB 661. This is an item that I discussed uh, at the last board meeting. And uh, what I want to note for the board is two things. Uh, Director Hansen and I uh, testify as witnesses uh, for Assemblymember McCarty in support of the legislation. And the legislation was amended uh, to apply only to our air district. So we are going to be running a pilot. Uh, but again, it's all about 
you know, getting ready when the next fire hits. Uh, we want to be better prepared. Um, we provided the actual bill language as, as it stands at the moment, so you have that in your package. Um, the next item is, is, is another important item for us, and those of you that are on the Sacramento RT uh, board, uh, I'm sure have heard from uh, my good friend, uh, Director Lee, about this issue. Um, we are very supportive of the idea of a green means go program that SACOG is trying to put in place. Uh, we understand the need. Uh, we understand the fact that the 19% target that we're trying to meet as a region is going to require additional investment from the state. Uh, but the thing that I need the board to be aware of is um, this cannot be at the expense of some of the programs that we ourselves are trying to generate. Uh, and uh, the reason I'm raising this concern to you is uh, there is obviously very clear nexus between the things that we want to do and the things that SACO wants to do with the cap and trade funding, the greenhouse gas reduction fund that the state is, is, is managing. So I think it naturally, uh, and I have no doubt that SACO, with the support of the board, is going to succeed, naturally the state is going to be looking at this and saying, okay, SACO has got the uh, funding for the Green uh, Means Go program. Uh, why does the Air District need funding for some of our mobility options? That's the thing that we're trying to avoid. And, and again, I, I, this is just simply to make you aware. Obviously, we're working with SACOG uh, very closely. Uh, we appreciate uh, the collaboration and the support from, uh, from uh, Director uh, Corliss. Uh, so more to come in the future. But again, I just wanted to uh, make you aware. Okay, we've got a couple board members signed up on this one. We're going to go with Board Member Hansen first, then Board Member Anatoly. Board Member Hansen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Alberto, for bringing this up. Um, we had a very active discussion of the Regional Transit Board about this. It hasn't come before our City Council, but there are some significant concerns that this will prioritize uh, just electric vehicles. Um, and not really invest in either transit or other smart programs that would reduce our base of VMT. Uh, and that also coincides with a couple challenges that I think particularly would impact us as the largest air district is it seems like a lot of this funding is geared towards the counties outside of Sacramento and the, the design of this program for um, those counties that um, rely on very far-flung commutes um, to, to help, um, and I just don't think we'll compete well in the way that SACOG has designed this program, whether it's as an air district, as a county, or our entities. And um, we asked for changes in the design of the program at Regional Transit, and I don't know if you're recommending any uh, challenges like allowing the air district to apply for funds, um, but I know at that point, um, uh, transit agencies, and I don't believe air quality agencies could apply for projects and proposals, that it was really only certain jurisdictions and certain types of projects that would qualify. And so 400 million is a lot. We haven't gotten our fair share of cap and trade money um, for affordable housing, for transit, for other things. And so I'd worry that this program does uh, tell the state, this is all we need. We don't need other money. And then when the program comes through, assuming it does, we're cut out. And I think that would be a, a, a real problem. So I'd encourage you and our lobbying team to really continue to advocate for the district yeah. and for Sacramento County at the table. Thank you, Board Member Hanson. Board Member Natoli. Yeah, I would just echo some of the comments that uh, Director Hanson made. <clears throat> you know, I think his description of the <clears throat> discussion at RT being robust, it was all that. Um, and I think you're pointing out, Alberto, the, um, you know, concerns as it relates to, you know, competitive funding and other funding streams that are important to this air district, important to the regional transit district, certainly important to our communities in this county and in the region as a whole. It's not to take away anything from an initiative that obviously tries to bring additional dollars and additional support for um, things that will help us uh, clean our air and become you know, <clears throat> mobile in a way that is smart. But I, again, I would um, echo what Director Hansen said, that I think you know, certainly you as the leader of this district and certainly this district board interest in you know, seeking funding that will be important to things that we need to implement that may, may be closely aligned or maybe a little different than and I one of the risks I think we do run and I'm you know not yet convinced that we don't run that even with an application that has good support is that if we're successful in getting 400 million yay for us as a region but what does that mean then to the, the uh, 
uh, various districts that uh, also rely on those state funding streams right. to implement uh, very important measures that without uh, we're not going to be successful and so i would just uh, uh, again uh, encourage you as well and certainly uh, want to be sure i put that on the record this morning thanks well thank, thank you, you very much member natoli thank you very much yeah I, I very much appreciate your support and that's precisely why i wanted to bring this up to to you and the only comment on that i would say is that uh, if we are going to be strong as a region um, then this is i think incumbent upon our apco our executive director from our team and our executive director from SACOG, all of us represent different parts of those bodies, but we have to come forward with a strong, solid message when we're going to the state. I think mm -hmm. that uh, if we're going to be successful, it's the unified effort that's going to be helpful. And that communication, and I, I do want to thank our, uh, our uh, Dr. Ayala for his uh, continuing to work and meet regularly with, with those directors so that we continue to have that communication. I know historically that may not have been, but I think what, what we need to do moving forward is it's not about the Air District, it's not about SACOG, it's not about RT, but it's how do we bring more dollars for the region. Um, thank you so much, uh, Director Guerra. That's, that, that's the crux of it. That's precisely it. The conversation I'm having with Director Lee and, and, and Corlitz is it's up to us yeah. to tell our story before the state, why we're all running uh, very important and different programs that need the funding. Great. And as you are suggesting, my thing is I don't want the success of SACOG to count against us when we're trying to develop our own programs. Uh, board member, I think it's uh, says Kennedy, but, uh, but we'll, we'll call him Harris today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm very happy to be a supervisor. I've wanted this position for quite a while. <laughs> Um, you may only be happy for about five minutes, but go, go for it. <laughs> It'll be a great five minutes, Don. And here I am next to you. So, 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 you know, one thing that can happen with various organizations is that they can silo. And there's always a benefit in being united. Yeah. So there's a benefit to Green Means Go. It's just that uh, the way it's presented has created fear amongst a couple of our organizations. Certainly with RT, there's a significant worry. There's also, I, I think, benefit to looking at this as an opportunity, because if we are united as a region, Great. it could be that we could be more successful of the state. So certainly we have to work out the kinks. There's no doubt about it. I wouldn't just walk away from Green Means Go. I see benefit in it. But we do have to get the directors on the same page. And uh, you know that really is up to you and Henry to work with James uh, to talk about these issues in a very real fashion. Um, and I believe we can get there. You know, I, I do see a lot of benefit in presenting a united front to the state. I think that we could possibly capture more cap and trade funds in that way. The distribution, of course, is, is, a, is a different matter, but these are things that need to be taken seriously, but it is really tr up to our directors with our, the support of your boards, because the support is there. And uh, if we can work out those issues, then perhaps we can gather more money for the region. Well, rest, rest assured, um, uh, Director Harris and, and Bora, that we're definitely um, uh, having those conversations and working together, absolutely. I concur with Supervisor Harris's uh, comments here. <laughs> Uh, we're uh, I'm looking at the time here, and I want to make sure that we have uh, time for action. So uh, a little unorthodox, but can we come back to the balance of sure. your APCO report after we conduct our, our voting business? Absolutely. We're going to move uh, to our consent calendar, um, and I'll ask a motion from the uh, um, uh, so board for a consent calendar. It's been moved by Board Member Harris, seconded by uh, Board Member Terry. <laughs> I mean, Hanson. Yes, sir. Supervisor. <laughs> Supervisor. Oh, so good. Jesus. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay. <laughs> Consent calendar passes. Uh, we're going to go to our fiscal year uh, proposed budget here. Um, board members, what I'm going to ask is this is about a 10 minute uh, report. And so if we could keep our questions till the end. Um, it is a, uh, a public hearing, so we'll have to open and close the public hearing at when, uh, when appropriate. Honey. 
Good morning, Chair Guerra and directors. My name is Jamil Moons. I'm the Administrative Services Division Manager for the district. Um, it is my pleasure this morning to present to you the proposed budget for fiscal year 1920. Um, this morning, let's see if we can get that going. This morning, we're going to talk very briefly about the development process, uh, about uh, an update on our new financial system, which most of you are aware we've recently implemented, and then uh, get into our budget and talk about the current year proposed budget, the difference between uh, the current year and, and the proposed next year, as well as some forecast trends and our proposed fee increase. So the budget development process is an annual process. We will be back here again next year at this time in the same process. Uh, the most important pieces of this are that we develop the budget and then we meet with the budget subcommittee of the board. So we did that this year on March 13th with the committee and uh, got their direction to bring this item to you today. We will have the public hearing today, which is our first public hearing, and we will have another public hearing next month in May, at which time uh, we would look to have the budget approved. Um, very briefly, uh, we did transition to a new financial system this year, which required us moving off the county system and, uh, and moving all of our funds to new banks. Uh, and we have an investment fund up with the LAIF, which is uh, the majority of our funds are maintained there, and then operating uh, funds in a local union bank. Um, this new system has allowed us to do much more robust reporting, to break down some of our funds into what we call managerial funds for better tracking, better cost accounting, and so we uh, will have greater transparency in those values and ultimately long-term efficiency. This year and a little bit into next year, it's been trying to run two concurrent systems, so our efficiency is not quite there. Uh, implementing a new system is a heavy lift, and uh, the finance team has done a fantastic job as well as all the districts. Um, moving over to a new system, but we're very hopeful and optimistic that it will provide great returns in the future. Just a note on the budget document that you did receive, there are some very minor changes to this document from last year. We used to have what we called a debt service fund. That was a separate broke out fund that has been incorporated into our building fund, our proprietary fund. We worked with our, our accountants and, uh, and auditors and, and that was a great way to, to manage that. I did want to comment on that. And there are some minor changes to account names and transitions from last year's to, to this year's. So our proposed budget is a budget that helps us implement all the priorities and initiatives that the district has. You've been hearing about them with the APCO reports uh, for the last several months, and, um, and they're obviously meeting our climate goals. We have the new Community Air Protection Program, which you've heard a lot about. That has affected our budget. It's an infusion of some additional funds, both operating funds as well as incentive funds, and you will see that in, reflected in this upcoming year's budget. Um, some of the directors are new, so I just want to take 30 seconds to go over the funds. So when you do read this, and for those directors who um, have seen the budget before, just a reminder, the 100 fund is our general fund. That is where all of our staff and our capital projects and everything is, is managed out of that fund. Um, the 400 fund is what's called a proprietary fund. It's a special accounting treatment, uh, governmental accounting treatment, and it accounts for our Coville administrative building. It's a very stable fund, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. The last fund, the 500 fund, you will see a lot of money in that fund coming in and going out. That reflects only our incentive projects. So all the incentive funds that we receive flow through that fund. So here is our proposed budget for FY1920. We have 65 million proposed in revenues and just over 59 million in expenditures. I will break down each one of these on this next slide a little bit more. So in, um, in the general fund, as I mentioned, that's where our, our employees and a lot of our capital and, and where our, what we consider our operating budget. This year's approved budget was 21.7 million. We're moving that to 22.9 million for a net increase of 1.2 million dollars. The proprietary fund is a very small fund. It's very stable. All it does is record the in and out of our building, um, the rents that come in, the outflows that go out to pay utilities, things like that. Very, very stable fund. <coughs> Special Revenue Fund, as I mentioned, is our much more volatile fund with influx of those incentive grants that are coming in and the outflows of those incentive grants. 
So we are proposing to put this year, we said 23 million in incentive projects out into the community. Next year, the team is uh, forecasting to put 35 million out into the community incentive grants. So that's a pretty exciting number. For the general fund, just some notable changes for the increases there. On the revenue side, we are getting an, an increase in the CAP, the Community Air Protection Program funding this year and uh, the upcoming year over the current year. The Measure A fund has gone up about 5.5%, which reflects about a $100,000 increase, which is, which is definitely helpful. And interest is increasing slightly from our new investment in the LAIF. Um, we have some minor decreases, uh, our CCAT Enhanced project where we scrap our, our old vehicles and we get that salvage uh, revenue back, that's proposed to decrease about $50,000 in addition to um, some other minor decreases. But for the most part, I would call our revenue a break even. Our permitting fees are about the same, our, um, our ARB subvention, our EPA grants, all of those are pretty level. Uh, we will, at the end of this presentation, ask you to consider for next month a fee increase uh, a, a adjustment for 3.6%, a COLA, on our permit fees. Um, that's still projected to be about a break even because we are losing several permits on one of our major uh, Title V, our Aerojet facilities. So um, that's going to be about a break even as well. So our revenues, for the most part, are break even going into 1920. On the expenditure side, we have two uh, main areas of increases. One is for employee services. Uh, our COLA is costing about $200,000, plus some additional amount for the step increases that employees receive and our pension and benefit costs. The other area is capital projects. Uh, we do have an increase because of the CAP program, the Community Air Protection Program, of about $700,000 in capital projects. On the decrease side, uh, the good news is we have been working very hard to streamline our professional services contracts, and we are realizing a savings of a little over $200,000 overall in our services and supplies area. Um, and we are, because of the incentive grants coming in, we are seeing a nominal uh, increase in that transfer of funds over to help offset um, some of our staffing costs to put those projects out on the ground. There are no staffing changes being recommended in this budget. Uh, the board uh, did take some action in uh, January and March to get our FTE where we needed them to get some additional staffing and a limited term capacity on board to address those new community air protection programs and restore some core critical district programs. Looking at the trend going uh, that, that we have come from on fund balance, <clears throat> overall you would see the district trend line at the top there increasing significantly. That's a reflection predominantly of, as I mentioned, those special revenue funds, that large influx of grants and the, the rate at which they come and go out. Uh, they're multi-year grants, so one year you might get 35 million in, but you only put 25 out. The next year you might get 20 million in, but you put 40 million out. So there's a lot of volatility in that one. But focusing on the blue line there, that is our general fund. And as you can see, we do have a structural imbalance and a deficit that has been decreasing gradually over time with a projected use of fund balance again this year to shore up that, that balance, to, to run <coughs> Our, our core basic programs here at the district and run those incentive um, projects. <clears throat> so looking forward, <clears throat> excuse me. As I mentioned, uh, our labor costs are outpacing our current revenues. We have uh, negotiated contracts of, of COLAs between 2 and 4 percent. This year it's 2.4 percent, so it's fairly nominal. But again, as I said, our revenues aren't keeping pace with some of those costs. In addition, restoring some of the positions that we have to continue doing the program. As you know, last year we held several vacancies, over a dozen vacancies, to help restore and reserve and take a break and pause and, and get us on track. And we've come back to the board with our stated challenge and some solutions, which I'll be talking about um, in a moment. Uh, as well as on the incentive gr uh, grant side, the amount we get to implement the grants doesn't always cover the cost of implementing those. So while we're bringing millions and millions of dollars to the region, we need some local revenue funds and our funds, our the, the funds we have, have to spread between all our needs as well as getting those incentive gr grants on the ground. Um, and what are we doing? As I said, we, we took a pause, we prioritized, we focused the resources on our most critical, important programs, 
and um, we're continuing to invest in technology. We've managed to save some positions by the use of technology and reallocate some positions and just decrease some positions in some cases as well. Um, and we've brought to you a revenue development strategy which I'd like to briefly review again today. This slide reflects what we call a middle path. When we came to you earlier in January and we did a presentation on different revenue streams that we could be looking at and considering, we took a high and a low kind of perspective. But for the forecast, we needed to land sort of on a middle number that we thought would be fairly reasonable and, and hopefully somewhat achievable. So reviewing those again, the measure A is a measure that's going out to ballot in 2020, we believe. We're very active, Alberto and I and other members of the district are participating on a, uh, a, a group uh, process to, to look at that and, and to work on, on, that, uh, on that measure uh, with STA. And the next one is the per capita, which we've mentioned before, per capita fee. And uh, again, our, our director and uh, some of the staff will be meeting with many of the local jurisdictions along with the board members to talk more about that program. All of these programs, and including a, a fee adjustment potentially on the permitting fees, getting more administrative admin, I, I, don't, I know we're time constrained, so I don't want to go into detail. What's really important is that these revenues are critical and essential to maintain our existing programs, not necessarily launch a bunch of new programs, but just to shore up that structural deficit I was talking about to keep the team we have now, to keep the programs we have now, as well as hopefully leverage some additional monies, particularly in the Measure A arena or the per capita, to, to attract more of those incentive dollars to the region and leverage that. So for one, every $1 we get here, we can potentially leverage 4 to $5 of incentives into the region. Okay. This is a forecast projection chart. Um, and what this shows is on the yellow line, as you see, we're going to trend down over the next year. We don't see any of those revenues coming into our, into our budget until, uh, until 2021. Um, and so for the first year, if we use all the reserves that are projected for the first year, we will see a, a use of those reserves. But we'll start to level off and we'll start to climb back if we see those revenues come in. If we don't see those revenues come in, that is the blue line right steeply down. Obviously the district would not allow that to happen. We would have to take steps to intervene on that and to mitigate that, which would mean all those programs we just talked about, a lot of the core programs we have now, check before you burn, some of the programs we don't receive any direct funding for, our complaints programs, some of our permitting, uh, enforcement activities, we would have to curve all of those back to try to accommodate you know, that, that gap to level out uh, the budget. So with that, I wanted to just briefly mention the proposed fee schedule you do have as part of your packet. We have our initial fees and our annual renewal fees, um, and they are increasing per, uh, per a rule that we have in place that does allow us to bring it to the board for a CPI increase of 3.6%. We are recommending that that go into play. That would generate about $200,000 in the stationary source uh, arena for revenues. Uh, as I said, we are losing some revenue from that program, so this will help shore that up given the loss of some of our, our bigger um, sources. So with that, um, I, I understand that was very quick and I'd be happy to answer any questions, but I would like to ask the board to open and close the public hearing, provide direction to, to the team, to us, on this budget and proposed budget to bring back to you in May um, for adoption of the final budget on May 23rd. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, Board Member Natoli signed up to speak here. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Jamil, and thanks to our staff. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of information beyond just budgetary that's in included in the document. Um, and it was on one of your slides, but I had noted it um, in my review of the material. And it's <clears throat> actually a little new information, I guess. Maybe the Budget Committee took it up. But when you look looking at the uh, potential new funding strategies, and it's on page 21 but <clears throat> of the budget, but it was on one of your slides. And that relates to, um, I guess, some consideration, um, maybe a, um, an addition to the conversation we had earlier in the year as it relates to a, <clears throat> and it's actually on, on page 20 as well, but a um, collecting a fee from homes with fireplaces. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> it's been over a decade since we prohibited <coughs> any fi fireplace, open fireplace construction in the county. Obviously, if you have certain types of devices, you um, uh, pellet stoves and so forth. 
I would just say that, um, you know, I, I don't know in what context you're going to bring this. I get the Check Before You Burn program, which is a good program, and, and I know it doesn't have a direct funding source behind it. I will think that will be, I would just want to give an early alert, uh, maybe staff has anticipated that that will be very controversial, and some of us may have more <coughs> homes with uh, older fireplaces, but a lot of uh, your older suburban communities, your rural areas of this county, and I know that um, we had quite a, again, a healthy discussion at the time. We decided we were, as Air District, uh, with our respective jurisdictions, no longer going to allow for fireplace construction. But to go in and, you know, again, <clears throat> depending upon use, I, you know, a lot of folks don't use them any longer, but uh, nonetheless, they're there, they can be used. And I, I would just say that um, as you're looking at this and whatever committee structures, you know, has, has looked at this, that was new to me in the context of you know, discussion because we talked about asbestos in, you know, in, in remodels for single family homes, uh, you know, for uh, uh, sheetrock and, 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 and such. But this, I guess this is the first time I'd seen this particular idea emerge. Um, and I just want to say that, that you know, if we're building, we're not building a budget around it. This is a multi-million dollar budget that has a small component. I trust we'll have the opportunity to have a very full discussion before this board because, again, I think whatever money that might generate, um, some of the, the goodwill I think we've built in this community, certainly in promoting clean air, uh, we can get a lot of, I think, very negative feedback from folks, uh, maybe some positive feedback from folks who want, don't want fireplaces at all. But uh, that's an amenity that goes in people's homes. And, uh, you know, for folks that have had homes that are, you know, built, you know, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago, and then somehow we're going to say, well, guess what? For having that, you're going to be charged a fee annually or otherwise. And I don't know what the concept is behind it. And I don't want to belabor it today. That's not the yeah. point of the budget. But I wanted to point that out, just to give you an early alert, because I hadn't talked with any of the staff about this. So. Well, thank you, Director Natoli, and we really appreciate the input. This was really more of a brainstorming exercise at the Budget Committee. We wanted to give an example of what those types of fees could look like, and through our brainstorm, one was, yes, these are the type of fees that we are allowed to impose. Clearly, we have not fully developed that. That would come back to the Budget Committee process if that particular idea was to go forward. So thank you, and I'm sorry that it came across as more of a concrete um, Oh, no, concept, no, it didn't. So. No, it didn't. I wasn't saying that at all. I just, but it was in, in, in material, we had the discussion Discussion earlier last year, and I know I sat in the budget committee for a couple of years, and we had that you know, other ideas that were floated, but this made it into print, and so I just I wanted to call that out in particular. So. Thank you very much. Thank you, Board Member Natoli. Uh, before um, um, we move on to any other comments, uh, do we have anybody signed up to speak? Then no, we do not. Okay, good. Then uh, I think uh, you know uh, want to thank my uh, members who are on the budget committee as well. Uh, the, the direction of ensuring that we get full cost recovery uh, and looking at that moving forward and as far as our recommendations, I do want to thank um, our staff for being prudent about you know, making sure that we're, we're uh, not going uh, over and above and beyond. We're trying to execute the actual service that we're providing um, and, uh, and also being diligent with uh, working with our independent, our individual city managers about uh, if we do have a conversation about per capita, what does that mean to every jurisdiction and, uh, and, and how we would move forward on that. And I think uh, there's some more work that needs to happen uh, on that part, uh, but at least at the very, uh, uh, at the, for, for this board member, um, ensuring that we get full cost recovery and, uh, and right sizing our fees uh, is, is appropriate. Um, with that, if there are no other questions, I'll ask for a motion to open and close the public hearing. It's, uh, it's been moved by a uh, board member Hansen and uh, seconded by board member Gaylord. Uh, Harris, Harris, yes. <laughs> Supervisor Hansen over here. Uh, and uh, any further discussion? If not, uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, measure passes. We'll see you guys at the, uh, at the next hearing on, on our budget. Okay, we're gonna move back to uh, the balance of our APCO report. Um, I wanted to make sure we had the conversation of uh, green means go before uh, we lost board members, but thank you. Uh, Dr. Ayala. Miss, Mr. Garrett, just to be clear, my motion was not only to open and close the public hearing, but to set say. the uh, budget for May 23rd hearing and adoption. Was that, do you concur with that, Mr. Gaylord? Yeah. Is the clerk okay with that? Just the staff Is council okay with that? Yeah. Good, yeah. perfect. Thanks for the clarity. <laughs> Appreciate the diligence. All right, um, I'll close this out real quick. Uh, the last two items are just uh, a couple important FYIs for the board. Uh, one thing is, uh, again, an exciting development in the world of mobility and transportation. Uh, Mr. Lemos and I had the pleasure of being able to 
uh, be invited to Phoenix for the unveiling of this uh, great technology. As you can see, it's a full uh, Class A heavy duty uh, rig. Um, you know, it's going to haul 80,000 pounds ac across the nation, uh, and it's fully zero emissions. It's not electric because you can't put a lot of batteries in things like this, but these commercial vehicles are going to be running on, on a fuel cell and hydrogen. Uh, and what we are working, with, uh, working on is, you know, how do we position Sacramento to be the rollout market so that we can begin to try uh, these great technologies. And the, the angle we're exploring is we want a, a municipal fleet and we want a private fleet. So there's a lot of work that we're doing with our partners in the area to see if we can actually make this happen. But again, I wanted to share that with the board that uh, some great developments uh, in the commercial sector, which is, is the biggest source of emissions, a big source of emissions, and frankly, one of the toughest to, to address. Um, and the last thing I wanted to share with you, again, is just as a means of giving you a leg legislative update. Um, we were in support of uh, Assembly Bill 1418, which has to do with uh, pursuing uh, faster and more electrification of the school buses. Uh, you should know that your district has deployed the largest fleet of zero emission electric school buses in the nation. We put in place, uh, thanks to Mr. Lemus's uh, uh, work and his team, uh, we have a fleet of 27 electric school buses uh, running in our region. But what's great about this is that we're anticipating bringing another 50 uh, in the near term. So you can begin to see that pretty soon we're developing a critical mass in terms of being a real player. Uh, and I think this one checks all the, box, uh, the boxes, right? I mean, it's zero emissions, it's new technology, you are advancing, pushing forward, and you're protecting our kids. So um, just wanted to uh, make you aware. You have a copy of the bill in your package. Uh, again, we were witnesses for Assemblymember Chewy, and um, uh, we provided a support letter uh, for 1418. Um, it's not a done deal. There is some further questions and controversy, right, because this is putting the uh, utilities on notice that they need to help electrify school buses. But again, I wanted to share that with the board. Uh, thank you. That concludes the APCR report. Well, thank you, Dr. Ayala and Assembly Member Chu. That's the Chu with an I on there, um, has been uh, a big advocate for uh, air quality. And glad that you guys were, we were there to, to represent. Um, one uh, side note on, on that piece, um, I do f see that the future of um, uh, our electric vehicles uh, in partnership with our community college district as we look at maintenance and repair and other jobs and ways that we can learn uh, in, in our roles as council members, we look at economic development and workforce development and supervisors, and I do think that uh, we should start looking at how do we how do we address that workforce part in the future? Because all of these buses are going to need some maintenance, and that's going to be a new pipeline of of good careers that don't necessarily always require a four-year degree, but are good-paying jobs. And I have a board member to totally also sign up to speak here. Yeah, I just I just I kind of to piggyback on what you were talking about, Eric, not just on the jobs part, but I think in what you you know talked about here this morning, and even in item five, it was on the consent calendar. But you look at the uh, you know, areas of where we're looking at, you know, the deployment of vehicles, the movement of people and goods, and I, you know, I think it's exciting that you know, we're attempting certainly when it comes to uh, your, your, your uh, rigs that can haul, you know, 80,000 pounds, but school buses, farm equipment, uh, locomotives, I mean, it's the, it, it's, it's the full gamut, and obviously personal vehicles, and, and, uh, and so, again, I just want to commend our district certainly for not only keeping this board apprised, but I think the, um, you, know, you penetrate into many different areas of the, of the community, both geographically, but certainly in, you know, in, in, in various aspects of daily life, uh, of, of work, uh, you know, and certainly in, 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 in travel. And so I think uh, uh, it shows this district certainly is a leader in many ways and appreciate the, the effort you put forth. Thanks. Thank you, Board Member Natoli. Yeah. Good. Uh, with that, uh, if there's no other comments, we, uh, we have, do we have anyone signed up to speak in the public comment? Uh, are there any board member ideas or comments? Any announcements? If not, then uh, we'll go ahead and adjourn at 9.47 a.m.